A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Oh my god. They did such a good job with this movie. This video is going to be full spoilers. If you have not seen the movie, it is your time to exit. This film stuck so close to the source material because I got all of the same feelings during the first scenes that I did in the book, and it was disturbing because it's me rooting for President Snow. I loved seeing how close Tigress and Snow are at the beginning of the film, and you see him with such a kind heart. The way he treats Tigress, the way he treats the grand man. The fact that he gets made fun of by the other capital kids for being kind to Sejanus, who's from District 2, it all sets you up to want to see Snow succeed. And his hopes are so high to get this plinth award to be able to go to the university for free because he doesn't want to tell anyone, but he cannot afford to go without this prize money. And it seems like he's in a pretty good position to get it until in the same scene we get Volumnia Gall and Dean Casca Highbottom announcing that they're not going to be giving away the scholarship because there's one more test and all these kids have to be mentors to tributes in the Hunger Games. The whole cast, but these two in particular, were just brilliant. They were so good. So like, I was very excited to see Viola Davis as Bloom Yagal because I thought she was probably one of the only people who could pull off this role. Because if you've read the book, Bloom Yagal sort of sings songs her way around life and is just really an oddball. And I was worried that in this film it would come across goofy. Because in the book, it's sort of creepy, but I was worried about how it would translate to screen. Snow has the District 12 girl who is specifically called the Runt as his tribute to take care of. So we see Snow get Lucy Gray, but then we like lightly backtrack and then we're in District 12 with Lucy Gray when her name gets called. And I loved this scene so much. I just, I've seen the Hunger Games movies so many times. I can like almost hear the dead silence and like the crunch of the gravel as Prim is walking up. Like all of that stuff, I've heard it so many times that it was just so jarring to watch Lucy Gray get out there and when she puts the snake in the mayor's daughter's dress, so good. <laughs> and then the other Cuffy starts singing to her and she sings back to them and like performs. In the book, I was like, this is so powerful. And then on screen, I was like, no wonder everyone in the Capitol thought she was lightly insane. In the comments of the trailer reaction video I did, somebody mentioned that a lot of this stuff she did live. And I think that's so interesting. And I'm wondering if we're going to be getting like studio versions of some of these songs because they were performed live. I at least hadn't seen any on Spotify yet. <laughs> when Snow shows up with the rose for Lucy Gray at the train station and she eats the rose petal, it was just exactly what my brain pictured. And this is something I love about Francis Lawrence's movies in this franchise. He just takes the exact imagery that I have in my brain and puts it on screen. When I saw Catching Fire, I was like, this is the first time I've ever seen a movie that was literally as if my brain was projected onto a screen. It was that close. And it's so weird to see Snow have a heart when he jumps onto this carriage transportation that they're all in. They're in this box with the tributes and he's trying to be with Lucy Gray and show that he's there for her. But then all of the other tributes, and this was so, like, it was intimidating. All the other tributes are like, maybe we should kill him. And that Reaper guy, whoever played him, good job. <laughs> Loki, Loki, this man's gonna kill him. They get to the zoo. There's Lucky Flickerman over there doing his news broadcast. He calls out, are you good? Lucy Gray, like, grabs his arm and she's like, you need to own this. <laughs> over there, Lucky Flickerman's still trying to get their attention. And he's like, can they not hear me? in this cage. So many like little moments from Lucky Flickerman. I think he was honestly probably our only comedic relief of the movie. It is a very heavy movie, but he brings Lucy Gray over and introduces her as like a lady, not necessarily the animal that all these capital people think the district kids are. And we get to see Lucy Gray just be so charming. They did such a good job just like portraying her personality as that type of person who talks to everyone. She knows everyone in the town, like everyone's heard of her and she has such a good stage presence, which is just such a wild contrast to Katniss, who doesn't want to talk to anyone who hates everyone and who really needs Peeta to be the performer in their relationship. She tells Snow to get them food, and when he does, and other people start bringing the tributes food and stuff, I kind of forgot about Arachne just being stabbed by one of the tributes when she's like playing with this glass bottle and the tribute's trying to grab it, and she finally does, and she smashes it and just 
stabs her. It was so brutal. So I remember from the very first movie when they specifically were talking about, and this was a different director, this was Gary Ross's version, and they were specifically saying we're going to downplay the violence. They didn't want to necessarily put it on a pedestal, and I think that was the right choice for that movie, but now that we're here and we're seeing like the evolution of it, and over and over we're hearing yeah. Lumia Gall talk about how people can change so quickly when they're placed in this type of environment. Seeing that violence was like really jarring, but also it drove the point home. It did, it did. <laughs> and obviously there was that rebel bombing. And we see the arena getting blown up. And I just loved the parallels that they did with Catching Fire with, you know how the stuff was like kind of falling from the overall like grating or whatever? It looked the same way. There were so many of these like little parallels, like obviously the bow from Lucy Gray, that's just like iconic because it's exactly what Katniss did. Later on, when Snow goes back to assess the damages of the arena, it looks like the arenas we know. So there's the, the crash in the middle. It looks like the cornucopia from, you know, the forest arena and the clock arena. There's all this stuff everywhere and all of a sudden there's all these places to hide. And he kind of scopes it out for Lucy Gray in advance. He goes to tell her about it. The almost kiss, the almost kiss. Oh my gosh. The whole thing with Clemencia was exactly how I pictured it. When she and Snow go in and they're talking to Gaul about the, their proposal that Snow wrote by himself that morning about things to help the tributes and get them money and stuff like that. And when Clemencia has to reach in and get bitten, this was the only part of the book that I remember not showing up in the movie is seeing Clemencia later. Because in the arena, those kids who get bitten by the snakes, they I think they just get bitten so many times that they die. But Clemencia doesn't die from her, you know, one or two snake bites. She ends up kind of turning into a snake-ish, like a mutt, because Volumnia Gall is like the inventor of mutt. I was as annoyed with Sejanus as I was in the book when he goes in and he's trying to do the sort of funeral rites kind of for Marcus because he was his classmate and Snow has to go in and get him. It was like I didn't even know what happened to the book. The way like my heart was pounding while he was in there. And when he had to kill Bob and to get out, I was so anxious. <laughs> the flag scene that is in the trailer with, I believe it's Reaper when he takes down the flag to cover up the dead bodies that oh, it was, it was sad. That one hit me in the heart. I didn't cry during the movie though, which is shocking <laughs> Honestly, another thing I forgot was that Jessup had rabies and then turns on Lucy Gray Which spurs on the water bombs. I'm sorry. That was so funny. Snow was talking to Jessup's mentor tells her Jessup's done for. And we know that anyone experiencing rabies is going to be afraid of water. And so they send in this water bottle. Uh, I just love that they, the drones aren't where they needed to be yet. So the water just like crashes and they send it and Jessup freaks out. And just Lucky Flickerman's reaction is hilarious. And anything he said, anything he did, he did such a good job with like line delivery. <laughs> All of the little asides he said, we're gonna fix that next year. Can I get a drink? <laughs> when it appears that the Hunger Games is gonna go late and he's calling to cancel a reservation for two with a high chair, which the high chair is obviously for Caesar. All of those little things were so good. And then later in the games when they're doing the water bombs, again, when Lucy Gray gets trapped by the career pack. Just the choreography for it was all so good. Snow puts the handkerchief with Lucy Gray's tear on it into the snakes before the snakes are taken to the arena. And when Volumnia Gall sees the snakes being released and sees that they're not attacking Lucy Gray. That's when she knew that Snow had cheated and she didn't say anything. She's watching Snow, who's watching Lucy Gray and watching the crowd because as she's singing, he's watching all these people just like wrapped attention. They're crying and they feel for these people and he's clearly getting the message in this movie that if we want the Hunger Games to work effectively, we need people to low-key love or hate different tributes and cheer for them. Meanwhile, Lucky's over here, see what happens when you do things because they're trying to enforce to the districts that if your kid goes into the Hunger Games and they perform and people like them, then that is what's gonna get them help in the arena. And it's that love that people had for Lucy Gray that got her out. When Snow walks in after the games and he sees his handkerchief and his mom's compact that had the rat poison that Lucy Gray used, my stomach dropped with him. It was so intimidating. One of my 
favorite scene, something that I just loved so much, was the dance hall in District 12 where Lucy Gray is performing because there's only so much you can get when a character is a like a singer or dancer or artist in a book. Like you just can't always get the full effect. And so when we saw her performing on stage, and it's just so perfect to District 12 because they paid such good attention to the music in this movie and they were careful to stick to the roots of I think like Blue Ridge Mountains, Appalachian Mountain, that area and what folksy music would sound like if they were to recreate it a hundred years in the future. And not only the music in this movie, it's also the score. Can we discuss? So when they had the first mention of Katniss, Maud Ivory brings Lucy Gray some Katniss and she tells Snow, a lot of people call this potato root or whatever, but I like Katniss, it has a nice ring to it. And I was like, ah. <laughs> and as soon as she says that, they play the opening part of the score from Catching Fire. It's so like that music is just so intense and it's so good. And they play it for the first time. Like that was the first time, at least in my noticing of things, that was the first time they ever called back to the score of the original trilogy. And then after that, they sort of introduce it into little bits and they only play it when Snow does something that evil Snow, like old Snow would do. Normal score, normal score, and then Snow would do something and they'd be like, let's drop in a little bit of the score from Mockingjay. And I just loved that they did that. The Hanging Tree song was so well done. The actual scenes of the hangings made me feel a little sick, but, <laughs> but as we get towards the end of the movie and and Sejanus is hung because of Snow's actions. Like this is when we start to see Snow sort of losing touch with who he is, just no longer believing that he's a good person, which brings us to some of the most emotional scenes of the entire movie. When they're gonna go take off, live in the woods, exactly what Gail told Katniss to do. And they get to that little house and Snow finds the guns. Watching Snow and Lucy Gray, they're changed in dynamic. They did such a good job with this. I feel like so many of the characters did an amazing job with just like these tiny little changes in facial expression and especially in this moment where we see Snow holding the guns and he's just first having his realization no one's gonna find these and no one's gonna know it was me. Now that doesn't let Lucy Gray off the hook because everyone knows that her ex-boyfriend is dead and the girl that her ex-boyfriend cheated on her with is dead and she's suddenly taken off for the hills. She can't go back to her regular life unless she snitches on Snow. And Snow can go back to his regular life unless Lucy Gray decides to go back to District 12 and tell on him. They're either going to stay together stranded or one of them gets to have their life back. And when Lucy Gray sees him holding the guns and they both kind of connect those thoughts, you see it happening and you see it happen for Lucy Gray first. When she grabs that knife and she's like, I'm gonna go get dig up some Katniss root and Snow tells her, you just said like two days ago that they weren't ready. And she was like, well, things change really fast. And he says, it's raining. And she's like, well, I'm not made of sugar. And she walks out, huh? <laughs> what a great moment because no, she's not. And by the end of the movie, I was like, she's a little evil too. <laughs> she leaves her shawl with a snake under it so that Snow will be bitten when he picks it up. So if you remember at the end of Catching Fire, when Katniss, there is no more District 12, and like just this award-winning moment of watching Katniss go from just shock to grief to anger, um, we work through all of those emotions. Jennifer Lawrence did it so well. And in this scene, we sort of get to see Snow go through those same emotions. He pulls up the thing and gets bitten. So he's shocked and like freaked out. And we see it in his face going from just like shock and like pain to a deeper pain when he realizes Lucy Gray left that for him to be bitten. He doesn't know if it's poisonous. And just this really intense betrayal and then like sadness that Lucy Gray doesn't trust him, but also anger because now he's not in control of the situation anymore. And he starts calling out for her and he tries to shoot into the trees for her. And obviously he hit her at some point and he goes and he finds her footprints and they just stop. And it's as if she died, flew away, something, which is exactly what happens to Lucy Gray in the song that Lucy Gray is named after, which was just a wonderful, full circle moment for us. And that's also when we sort of see Snow lose it for a little bit. He's always such a controlled person and keeps everything pushed down emotionally. And him just spraying bullets 
into the trees. And the reason he's doing this is because Lucy Gray started singing The Hanging Tree and all these mocking jays start to sing it around him. It's driving him mad. And that's so beautiful because what does Katniss sing as the song of the rebellion? The Hanging Tree. And so not only is it like hurting him to hear that song as an adult because Lucy Gray made it, it's also haunting him because it's what Lucy Gray said before she disappeared. Without Lucy Gray, Snow goes back to his normal life and instead of being upgraded to two, like he originally was supposed to, Dr. Gall brings him back to the Capitol for turning in Sejanus, where he takes Sejanus's parents' money because they don't know that he's the reason their son is dead. They just know that he saved him in the arena and so they're funding his life. He's back in this world of luxury that he experienced as a child and he wanted so badly to save Tigress and the Grand Man. But at the end, when he comes out in this, you know, decadent suit and is starting to become the snow that we know, the Grand Man's like, oh, he looks so wonderful. And Tigress is like, like, you look like your father. That's not necessarily a compliment coming from her which obviously is the beginning of the break in their relationship. She was such a caring character, and so to see her sort of distance herself from Snow, uh, that was his last chance at having a shred of humanity, was sort of if Tigress could influence him, and I feel like in that moment that was her, I wash my hands of this, you are bad. And his, who he becomes as Snow, gets just solidified when he poisons Casca Highbottom. He goes and talks to him and Casca is just so defeated and drugged up and we find out the reason that he is like that is because of Snow's father being the one to implement the games and now Snow's son, like a reincarnation of him, has decided to make sure the games stay by figuring out how to get people to watch because he wanted them to be eliminated forever. Because Casca is sort of a loose end for Snow, he does poison him. I'm pretty sure that's his first poisoning. It was just so good. This movie gets like a 10 out of 10 from me. I think when I'm trying to rank the movies, I feel like Catching Fire is probably my all-time top favorite. It just was exactly how I imagined it. And then I feel like maybe the original Hunger Games for the nostalgia factor. <laughs> Probably Ballad and then the two Mockingjay movies. So here's the thing, is that we end the movie not knowing if Lucy Gray actually made it or not. It, does she make it back to District 12? Does she somehow end up in 13? Or did she just die of her gunshot wound? I mean, it is like Lucy Gray in the song who just disappeared and no one knows. This movie was so well done. I'm gonna go see it again probably tomorrow. <laughs> Please like this video if you liked it. Click subscribe if you want to talk about more book stuff. My name's Kaylin. Thanks for watching. Bye.